an incredible shock. On the 23rd of June 2016, for the first time in history, one of the largest countries in Europe decided to leave the European Union. The total number of votes cast in favour of leave was 17,410,742. This means that the UK has voted to leave the European Union. After three years of lies, fake news and political stalemate, Brexit has still not been delivered. As negotiations to secure an amicable divorce held between Theresa May, the UK's Prime Minister, and the European community seem at the point of collapse, the country continues to tear itself apart and the people are beginning to feel betrayed. But how did it all come to this? We've gone out to meet the British people, as well as some of the political heavyweights who have been playing a role behind the scenes, like Nigel Farage, the Leave extremist, Tony Blair, the former British Prime Minister, but also the former French President François Hollande and even Michel Barnier, tasked by the EU to defend European interests. Brexit also marks an opportunity to examine over half a century of strained UK-EU relations. We are asking is for a very large amount of our own money back but what future does this political earthquake have in store for the rest of the continent? Because if Brexit is threatening the unity of the UK, it could also destabilise Europe itself. This boat, which connects the United Kingdom to the continent, is the symbol of unity between Europe and the British. Down. We cannot allow for it to be delayed. We cannot allow for a transition period to go on until the next general election. We've got to stand up and fight again. And we are going to win. We are going to win. We are going to win. Have the British lost their legendary stiff upper lip? For the Brexiteers, the referendum was an opportunity to vent their anger. You only need to look at the electoral map to realise the extent to which Brexit has split the country in two. The pro-Europeans are in London and in big cities like Liverpool, as well as in Scotland and Northern Ireland. The Brexiteers, meanwhile, are concentrated in small towns, the countryside, and wealthy areas in South London. Only a million votes separate the Brexiteers from the Remainers, one million out of 33.5 million voters. But it has brought about a complete breakdown. It was an angry demand to be heard. They feel that established rules did not deliver fair outcomes in our country. They felt that established political parties you know, were not representing the interests of ordinary working people in our country. You know, they felt that the whole country was run in the interests of people who were protected and privileged, whereas they were exposed. And I've been a member of parliament, remember, in the north of our country, many, many, many miles away from London. So I understand this feeling that, you know, let's show those people that we count again. Let's show those people in London uh, that, you know, we can say no. Let's poke them in the eye so that they listen to us. To understand the social and political chaos taking place in the country since the referendum, you need to go back to 2016. 
For five months, out activists, also known as Brexiteers or Leavers, battled in supporters, aka Remainers. Full of lies and fake news, the five month campaign was set against a backdrop of patriotism and nationalism. Among the most inflammatory Brexiteers was Nigel Farage, the charismatic leader of UKIP, the Europhobic UK Independence Party. If you really go back to that referendum campaign, what was it actually all about? Do we stay part of a European political union and say we're better off as part of a bigger entity? Or do we vote for independence? and we voted for independence. And independence means you make your own laws, you control your own borders, you have your own courts, you are a country. What the Brexit campaign succeeded in doing is taking uh, an issue that only a portion of the country are really concerned about, which is sovereignty, and linking it to immigration. They said, we can't control our borders because we're not in charge of our laws. And then they persuaded people that that was something that directly affected them, that somehow their jobs were at threat or their housing was at threat. It's what's always used to scare people about immigration. Immigration as the explanation of every problem, a slogan which also resonates in the UK. During the campaign, the small town of Boston on the UK's east coast became the Brexiteers' chosen symbol of the anti-immigrant propaganda. And this is no coincidence. Since 2004 and the enlargement of the EU, the region has welcomed migrants from Eastern Europe. A decade later, these migrants represented 10% of the regional population. Result? 75% of Boston voted for Brexit. A national record, but it is based on lies. What was in cause was immigration coming de pays européens, c'est-à-dire la libre circulation au sein de l'Union européenne. Le grand débat au Royaume-Uni, il a été là-dessus, c'est-à-dire par rapport à des Polonais, à des Bulgares euh, qui euh, venaient, au nom de règles européennes, travailler au Royaume-Uni. Il y a 3,5 millions de personnes européennes qui travaillent et vivent au Royaume-Uni, qui, qui travaillent au service de l'économie britannique. Et ils ne sont pas arrivés par hasard, euh, ils ont été accueillis. Donc ça, ça c'est pas de la migration, c'est de la liberté, c'est la liberté de circulation actuelle qui caractérise l'Europe. The anti-immigration campaign gained ground in the polls. Nigel Farage decided to go further and threw more into the mix. He not only criticized Eastern Europeans, but also majority Muslim migrants from the war-torn Middle East. The campaign is called Breaking Point. Farage plastered posters all over the UK saying, we must leave the European Union and take back control of our borders. But the photo behind the slogan triggered reactions in the press. Why are you picking on people's misery? All of the people in that picture behind you are <coughs> fleeing atrocities in Syria. How do you know that? And you've got them on a picture to do with our well, membership of the European Union. Well, a refugee, all right, and we've had this since the Geneva Convention of 1951, is somebody fleeing in fear of their life because right. they're going to be persecuted because of who they are or what they and are. The people behind you are all fleeing for their lives from a war in Syria. Uh, you don't know that. You don't know that. They're coming from all over the world. In fact, the estimate was that fewer than one in five uh, that were coming in that big wave last year were coming from Syria. Nigel Farage is telling a whopping lie and he knows it. The photo he used and distorted was part of a report by press photographer Jeff G. Mitchell published on the 23rd of October 2015. Photographed in Slovenia on the border with Croatia. These refugees were fleeing from a war in Syria and the Middle East. Despite this blatant twisting of the facts, the poster was never taken down. Two years later, Nigel Farage still stands by it. It has even been copied by European nationalist movements. That breaking point poster was ahead of its time. I mean, you know, that breaking point poster was actually used by Viktor Orban in his Hungarian campaign. That breaking point poster is the reason that you now have a completely brand new government in Italy. 
it was absolutely the right thing to say at the time. Now, sometimes, you know, you tell the truth and people find it a bit difficult, but I don't resile from it one little bit. Were the British taken advantage of by this poster? Or were they enticed by anti-immigration slogans? It's over. Oh, God. What? Are you absolutely mental or something? Have you actually considered what leaving would mean? You're so patronising. Though they have undoubtedly lost a little of their composure, the English have held on to their famous sense of humour. Since the referendum, television and websites are full of satirical films like this one. Broadcast by the BBC, this mini-drama is called Breaking Up with a Remainer. Sure, we have problems, but it's better to be inside the relationship pissing out than outside the relationship pissing in. If you leave, I'm keeping all the cheese, OK? OK. You'll starve. Bye, Frank. Racist. Boris Johnson is the other big star of the campaign. He's the official figurehead of it. He also uses immigration as a propaganda weapon. This time, not from an identity, but an economic standpoint. MP and Mayor of London from 2008 to 2016, he is the man who has led the Eurosceptic rebellion from within the Conservative Party, the party in power. And to convince the electorate, he goes up and down the country aboard a bus denouncing what Europe costs the British economy. And if we vote leave on June the 23rd, we can take back control of £350 million a week yes. and spend on our priorities here yes. in this country, yes. including on the National Health Service. We can take back control of our immigration system. Where will this £350 million come from? For Boris, it covers the money the UK contributes every week to the EU budget. The problem is that the Brexiteers deliberately forgot to consider the benefits that the EU repays Britain. The discount on European contributions obtained by Margaret Thatcher. Aid from the Common Agricultural Policy. Funding for poor regions. Interest on British capital in the European Investment Bank. The UK actually pays the EU £130 million every week. That's two and a half times less than Boris Johnson maintains. Even his own party are far from agreeing on these assertions. I was very careful with the figure and I would have had them change it. But look, what, the tr what is the truth about why they did that? They said one day, they gave in, it's like, all right, we'll get the, re we'll get the bus repainted and they came back with £50 million a day. Why did they keep doing it? Why did they double down on it? To get publicity. At the end of the war, Britain created the NHS. It protects us through our Boris Johnson's lives. campaign was such a success because it focuses on what the British it. hold dearest, the NHS, week, the national healthcare system, the ultimate manipulation. Online clips like these the confirm Euro that is Britain's NHS is directly threatened by immigrants. The upcoming membership of Turkey, amongst bailouts. others, to the EU epitomised these blatant lies. When Albania, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia and Turkey join the EU. Imagine our money being spent on our priorities. You can make this happen. Members of the government uh, did at least not deny uh, very strange stories like 80 million Turks would be in the European Union by 2020 and would have automatic freedom of movement to come to the United Kingdom. The European Union was being wrongly accused by the racists of being responsible for a surge in, in uh, immigration, which had nothing to do with the European Union. While some politicians like Lord Kerr quickly took note of the fraud, they did not denounce it. They allowed the electorate to delude themselves with the promise of taking back control and by the general positivity of the campaign. And according to my cousin John, it worked. The Remainers entrust the Treasury with their destiny and their political campaign. 
For Osborne, the British feel so un-European that you have to talk numbers to convince them. The result? An austere campaign that doesn't say one word about the Brexiteers' fake news. Well, when we looked at trying to persuade people to vote to remain, it was clear that they were not going to be persuaded, uh, in large numbers at least, by some uh, belief that Britain had a European identity. Uh, nor were they convinced that there were great security benefits. And so we ended up in the campaign talking a lot about the economic benefits of being in the EU and the economic costs to leaving. Brexit might be for the richest in our country, but I tell you, people on low incomes, people on insecure incomes, they are the people who suffer when the economy fails and goes into recession. Let's not impose that on this country. The problem was, and this is something that all British politicians for many years have got to take responsibility for, no one had really been spelling out the benefits of EU membership for decades. So when it came to the campaign and you had only a few weeks to try and talk to the British people about uh, the benefits of EU membership, they were not really receptive. Caught between lies and gloom, the British are disorientated but they still have the comic spirit to invent the fake news card game. Since 2017, accusations of embezzlement and suspicions of foreign influence have tarnished the Brexiteers' campaign. These denunciations have come to light due to whistleblowers like Shamir Sani. This young activist worked for the Brexiteers at their campaign HQ. Today, he condemns the arrangement to exceed the limit on funding their campaign was allowed, which led to a Leave victory. He also criticizes the involvement of a Canadian company in influencing the votes. The same company has been linked to Cambridge Analytica, questioned during Donald Trump's election. That right there, behind the guy with the blue shirt. That's Zach Massingham. Now, Zach Massingham obviously is formerly SEL Canada, um, who obviously, you know, set up Cambridge Analytica, um, is now banned from the United Kingdom as well as Canada. Now I know that it was a coordinated scheme for vote leave to overspend, to break the law. It was intelligent. It was smart, it was calculated, but what they didn't expect was for a 22, 23-year-old Pakistani dude that was doing so well within British politics to come out and say, you know what, this is wrong. Thanks to the documents Shamir Sani provided, an international investigation showed that SCL Canada had also illegally spent funds on an aggressive pro-Brexit campaign on social media. And it was Shamir himself who came up with the slogans based on the psychological profiles of the targeted population. Like this one, sent to 400,000 people who had taken a look at another of Boris Johnson's fake news slogans. Outside the EU, we will at last be able to sign free trade deals with the US and China. You think ads like this don't have an impact on you. You always think that you're smarter than this, but you're not. No one, no one is smarter than a targeted advert that is uh, that an algorithm. These networks, they are very well weaponized. They are very well funded. They have the use not only of traditional right-wing media, but much more importantly, an ability to orchestrate uh, and manage uh, and push public opinion. Uh, by social media, by digital uh, means. This is a much bigger existential uh, political threat uh, to Europe's stability uh, and the effective functioning of normal mainstream politics than we have ever known before. The anti-Europe demonization campaign run by Brexiteers on social media was just as efficient as what the press had relayed and even exaggerated. At the time, 75% of the articles published in British newspapers were pro-Brexit. Journalist and novelist Rachel Johnson 
Boris's sister, was working for the Daily Mail, one of the biggest tabloid newspapers in the country, which she has since quit. The Johnsons are a divided family, just like mine, between pro and anti-Brexit. When you have day after day after day, um, a mass market, powerful mass market tabloid attacking all the institutions of the British state and from, you know, the MPs to um, the civil service being the enemies within, using language that we last heard in the 30s, I think, of course, it's going to seep through. There is a, it's releasing a toxin into the bloodstream. <laughs> and the poison will end up taking a victim. On the 16th of June 2016, a far-right activist assassinated Jo Cop, MP and member of the Labour Party. She was a pro-European. According to the witnesses at the scene, as he killed her with a knife, the man cried, Britain first, the name of an extremist far-right group. It is entirely appropriate that all campaigning for the referendum has been suspended. All of us are united in our deep sadness at the loss of one of our brightest and most popular Westminster colleagues. Thank you. Despite the emotion generated by the drama, Brexit took over again eight days later. Behind this populist Brexit lies the myth of the lost grandeur of the British Empire. It's this vision of a powerful and dominant England that the Brexiteers have glorified and pitted against Europe, which encouraged certain members of the upper classes, or aristocrats, to join in. Like in Kent, a fairly wealthy area also known as the Garden of England, where a majority voted for Brexit. The Commonwealth is made up of 53 member states, almost all of which are former territories of the British Empire. This organization, officially established after the war, still reunites regularly around this table. At its head sits the Queen of England, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, India. In total, two and a half billion people, or one quarter of the world's population. For the Brexiteers, it is the future of the United Kingdom. It is unarguable that we have closer ties to New Zealand or Canada than we have to, you know, Finland or Bulgaria. That's not any uh, slighting comment on my friends in Finland or Bulgaria. It's simply that the, those ties of language and law, habit and history, migration, family, uh, can't be replicated by bureaucratic fiat in, in Brussels. Uh, one of the big arguments against joining the EEC was exactly that we were, as it were, abandoning uh, our friends in the Commonwealth. This did not stop Daniel Hannan from taking his seat in the European Parliament, just like another fierce supporter of Brexit who, thanks to the campaign, was also given the opportunity to oppose Europe's faults with the alleged virtues of the Commonwealth. Nigel Farage has been an MEP since 1999 is that only as an independent country, free of the European Union, can we choose our own destiny in a 21st century that is changing rapidly. We have a particular uh, good position compared to the rest of Europe through the Commonwealth that many of the fastest growing economies in the world speak English, have common law, and rather like us. So for us, it's a no-brainer <laughs> to say, yeah, of course, we want to be friendly with our European colleagues, on se demande dans quel siècle vit Nigel Farage quand même, parce que le Commonwealth s'est fini depuis longtemps. Euh, ça a commencé à s'évaporer se, se, au lendemain de la Seconde Guerre mondiale. C'est le moment où l'Inde gagne son indépendance, c'est le moment où l'Australie euh, s'éloigne. Le Commonwealth s'est terminé. Il reste une empreinte britannique, mais c est, c est, pardon, la comparaison vous avec la France aussi. Nous sommes des pays qui avons été les grandes puissances mondiales, qui avons dominé le monde. Et aujourd'hui, notre seul multiplicateur de puissance possible, c'est l'Europe. The Brexiteers are dreaming about a new Commonwealth. They have even given it a name, Global Britain. 
a Great Britain, free from all the EU's limitations and able to trade with the rest of the world. A handful of ultra-liberals and bankers from the city lie behind this model of global free trade and deregulation. Their reference is Singapore, a former colony which has since become a tax haven. So before the referendum, Change, uh, Change or Go was produced by Business for Britain. As you can see, it's a very considerable cons uh, uh, study of the issues, and that's the positioning of it the UK at the centre of the world, talking about what we export, the values we export, our service economy trust, the fifth largest economy in the world, English as one of the world's main languages, and, and so on. And, and that really, you know, it's lot, not like we didn't do the work, but this, this idea of global Britain, it's about, it's about self-government, it's about freedom, it's about treating people equally wherever they may come from in the world. You would rather be poor in Singapore than almost anywhere else. You would rather be ill in Singapore than almost anywhere else. There's, there's no criteria that the parties of the left point to where you wouldn't be better off in Singapore than in a Western country, or almost none. How did they do it? Right? They have zero natural resources. They have to import their own. Everything they eat, everything they drink, their electricity, everything. Right? How did they do something so miraculous? The answer is they opened their markets. They removed all of their trade barriers unconditionally. They didn't wait to see whether the other country was reciprocating. They invited the traffic and commerce of the world. As Hong Kong had done, and as since then New Zealand and now Australia have done, it is a formula that works every time. And I hope that a post-EU Britain will do that, but on a much bigger scale. London a.k.a. Singapore on Thames, the capital of a new world where unrestricted financial markets would take control. But is this the future that millions of Brexiteers voted for? The biggest risk that there is with Brexit is that four or five years down the line, the intellectual driving force behind Brexit is going for an ultra-Thatcherite agenda. And the people that came through in their millions, particularly former Labour voters, frankly, who did so, are saying, no, we, what we wanted was Britain to be more isolated from all of these forces of global change. So this is going to be a big problem when people realise that Brexit, Brexit isn't the answer to any of our problems. In the UK, more and more are refusing to remain helpless in the face of the impending catastrophe. On the 20th of October 2018, more than half a million people protested in the streets of London, proclaiming their attachment to the EU. Was Brexit needed for the British to finally feel European? In the crowd of these Remainers is Rachel Johnson, the sister of Boris Johnson, the champion of Brexit. Despite her attachment to her brother, she continues to publicly defend her pro-European ideas. See, it's taken the referendum to make people care about Europe. Yes. Before, it was only 12 on the list of salient well, you know, topics in an election. Who were the Remainers campaigning with their heart out? Yeah. It's also taken the referendum to make people see what they loved about Europe, what they cared about, why they wanted to stay inside Europe. Yeah. It's true, so all the lawyers against Brexit are prosecuting you. Put it on your door. This is 48% of the people. That's not a bubble. That's not an elite. There is no elite with 17 million people in it. So, you know, the elite is gold. The elite is Johnson. The elite is Rhys Mogg and Farage. All millionaires. All, all millionaires. They don't have to worry about the future. Maybe why, are you, why are you here today? To save the country. And hopefully we we'll save Europe as well, because it's not going well. Europe is an idea. So you've got emotion versus empiricism. You've got belief versus reason. And belief will always triumph over reason because it can never be disproved. We are here to disprove that today. Thank you very much.
Not a day passes without pro-Europeans protesting outside the windows of Westminster. They are demanding that MPs do not forget the primary reason behind the European project, prioritising the establishment of a long-standing peace. This was a principle established in 1946 by Winston Churchill himself, but even then it signalled a very difficult marriage. Men will be proud to say, I am an European. We hope to see a Europe where men of every country will think as much of being a European as of belonging to their native land. We hope that wherever they go in the European continent, they will truly feel, here I am at home. We had not been on. Uh, we had not been uh, defeated in the war. Britain alone had fought. There was not quite the same sense that we needed that solidarity and unity with other European countries. Churchill was right. For the British, their destiny resided in this young queen, Elizabeth II, crowned amongst popular jubilation. Meanwhile, on the continent, the Inner Six was set up. Built around the Franco-German partnership. However, faced with a post-war economic crisis, the British government proposed the creation of a free trade zone before changing sides and asking to become a member of the single market. But General de Gaulle met this with scorn. Alors il est possible qu'un jour l'Angleterre parvienne à se transformer elle-même suffisamment pour faire partie de la communauté européenne sans restriction, sans réserve et préférence à quoi que ce soit. Et dans ce cas-là, les six lui ouvriraient la porte. I think he knew us actually better than some of the British politicians of the time did. And he, he said, look, this is a question of economics more than anything else. Britain is a country with global supply lines. It's a country with, with links of language and law to every continent. It, it is never going to be comfortable in a regional customs union. Voyez toute la presse anglaise ce matin, voyez les titres. Oui, nous entrons dans l'Europe. Britain's admission to the EU had taken no less than 25 years, and even then, it was easier said than done. Because if the conservative and very liberal Margaret Thatcher was going to play a role in Europe, she would demand concessions first. In France in 1984, at the Fontainebleau summit, Thatcher uttered one of her most famous statements, a little remark which you would think the Brexiteers had drafted. May I make a few comments first? One of the difficulties here has been to get clear the nature of the problem. We are not asking for a penny piece of community money for Britain. What we are asking is for a very large amount of our own money back. There was always this notion of appartenance partial, which means that, in fact, there was also a problem for the British. Europe was not a solution. It was a very solution, and it was an adhesion that was not enthusiastic for the moment. It was only in 1997, when the Labourite Tony Blair came to power, that the country had become an enthusiastic member of the EU at last. Blair unquestionably accepted the principle of free movement. When the EU grew its membership in 2004, over 2 million Eastern European migrants settled in the UK. 
This was a massive migration of European workers which would play a crucial role over 10 years later in deciding Brexit. At the time, it was not a big issue. Because frankly, if you go into any centre of hospitality in this capital city of London, you will find lots of Europeans working there, or our health service, lots of Europeans, or our tech sector or financial service sector, lots of Europeans. We need these people. Alas, international crises came in quick succession for Tony Blair. Following on from the Iraq war, they weakened him until the point where he resigned halfway through his third term. Labour managed to hold on to power until the financial crash hit in 2008. The global economy was unstable and wars in the Middle East forced waves of migrants towards Europe. Such social and economic chaos gave rise to populist movements. In the UK, the Conservatives returned to power. But lying in wait was Nigel Farage and UKIP, his UK independence party, who raked in extra votes in every European election. I tell you what, the one prize I do deserve is the prize for sheer persistence because I stuck at it for 25 years, because I just believed it was the right thing to do. Threatened by the rise of the far right and far left, the Conservative Party panicked. To avoid losing his power, Prime Minister David Cameron promised the British public a referendum and opened Pandora's box. This political opportunism led to his fall, and what's worse, launched the country into political pandemonium. We will give the British people a referendum with a very simple in or out choice to stay in the European Union on these new terms or to come out altogether. It will be an in-out referendum. There was no public demand for a referendum. David Cameron called the referendum in order to resolve an internal fight in his own party. But once he had done that, he triggered uh, the most extraordinary deployment of media power, of, of money, uh, of, of international uh, uh, forces that were very hostile to Europe. In an attempt to gain an advantage, David Cameron tried the impossible to get the in to win. He negotiated exceptional measures to reassure the most Eurosceptic members of the electorate. But one thing throughout all of this will be constant, and that is my determination to deliver for the British people a reform of the European Union, so they get a proper choice in that referendum that will hold an in-out referendum before the end of 2017. That will be constant. But there'll be lots of noise, lots of ups and downs along the way. David Cameron aurait voulu que le principe de libre circulation des personnes puisse être euh, renégocié dans un, dans un statut spécifique pour euh, le Royaume-Uni. Et là, je pense qu'on était tous d'accord, euh, la chancelière Merkel et moi-même, pour dire si vous voulez être dans le marché unique, avec tous les avantages qu'il procure, vous devez accepter la libre circulation. Quand il est revenu empty handed from the renegotiation, I think people responded by saying, hang on, you know, we're the second biggest financial contributor. And this is how we're treated before we vote. This is how they treat us now. How will they treat us if we vote to remain? Uh, and it was at that moment, I think, that leave became inevitable. That was how the impossible marriage between the UK and EU came to an end. But it was also the start of an incredible desertion from politicians, leaving the British astonished and wounded. I do not think it would be right for me to try to be the captain that steers our country to its next destination. The next day, negotiations began within the Conservative Party to find the person who would manage the divorce. Boris Johnson seemed best placed, but caught up in power games, he also threw in the towel. Les euh, tenants du, du Brexit euh, 
n'ont pas voulu euh, prendre la responsabilité euh, de la direction du gouvernement. Boris Johnson, le premier. Et ils ont laissé euh, Theresa May, qui avait appelé au maintien, non pas à la sortie, assumer euh, cette responsabilité. As the political parties tore one another apart and the country seemed on the brink of implosion, the Queen had another trick up her sleeve. Just one year after the referendum, during the traditional opening ceremony of Parliament, she seemed to be dressed in European colours. A very royal way to wish Theresa May, the new Prime Minister, good luck for her negotiations with the European community. My government's priority is to secure the best possible deal as the country leaves the European Union. My ministers are committed to working with Parliament, the devolved administrations, business and others to build the widest possible consensus on the country's future outside the European Union. Just this once, the 27 member states of the European Union put up a united front. In response to the demands of the UK, Michel Barnier and his team are tasked with defending the interests of the EU. This mission will turn out to be particularly delicate. The Brexit negotiation is very difficult for Britain for two reasons. You know, first, trying to get the benefits of EU membership without the costs is a tough thing to negotiate and the European Union have not allowed that. But second, the issues around Brexit, about the kind of country we want to be, whether we want to be internationalist, whether we're pro-globalization, whether we welcome immigrants to our shores, these are all crystallized in the Brexit debate. C'est le Royaume-Uni qui quitte l'Union européenne. C'est pas nous qui quittons le Royaume-Uni. Et donc en quittant la maison commune parce que le fonctionnement ne leur plaît pas, parce qu'ils n'aiment pas la Cour de justice, parce qu'ils ne veulent plus payer, parce que les réglementations européennes pour l'environnement, les droits sociaux, euh, pour les normes industrielles ne leur plaisent pas, parce qu'ils veulent une politique commerciale euh, solitaire plutôt que d'être dans notre politique commerciale pour négocier avec les Chinois ou les Américains. Euh, euh, ces règles-là, on ne va pas les changer. After a year and a half of negotiations, the two parties finally reached an agreement. But the British Parliament in Westminster reject Theresa May's deal. At this stage, the British can only cling on to their legendary sense of humor to face an increasingly absurd situation. Before we start, I want to be absolutely clear about one thing. We are here to serve the British people, not the whims of some European imperialist state. Yeah. We are a proud nation, and no bureaucrat in Brussels can tell us what to do. They took our sovereignty, our dignity, the very essence of our Britishness. And what has the European Convention of Human Rights ever done for us in return? Yeah. Oh, the right to a fair trial. What? The right to a fair trial. Well, that's true, I suppose. The right to but... privacy? Well, yes, all right. I grant you fair trials and privacy are two things the European Convention of Human Rights has given us. Freedom of expression. Yeah. Freedom from discrimination. But apart from these, what has the European Convention on Human Rights ever done for us? Peace in Northern Ireland? This time, it's no longer a laughing matter. Democracy and peace are under threat. Brexit has recast the lingering shadow over the civil war in Ireland. A war which pit Protestants and Catholics against one another. Tragedy going back three centuries. It's in large part thanks to Europe that peace was restored in Ireland. In 1998, Tony Blair signed the Good Friday Agreement with Bertie Ahern, the then Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland. There was a huge antagonism between the Irish and the British over many, many years. 
And one of the things that gave rise to the Good Friday Agreement was being both in Europe, often partners in Europe, often sharing the same perspective about Europe. It just created the atmosphere, or partially created the atmosphere in which the Good Friday Agreement was possible. So now separating the UK and the Republic from that relationship in Europe is a very, very big deal in, indeed. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a, a huge problem. This problem is war, which could put the Irish Catholics and Protestants in opposition once again, like it did 20 years ago. Europeans and Brits are well aware of this and agree on this crucial matter, to never re-establish a border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. But as the UK wants to leave the customs union, the goods have to be checked somewhere. The eventual solution Europe proposed is called the backstop, a sort of border at Irish ports and airports. Yet the British refuse any form of separation between Great Britain and Northern Ireland within the United Kingdom. This is why the agreement has been rejected by British MPs and the situation has reached a total impasse. This is a serious concern for Professor Kevin O'Rourke, an Irishman and international trade specialist. History is probably coming back and it's coming back in a, in a, in a bad way. I mean, bilateral Anglo-Irish relations for sure have been severely damaged by this. I mean, so from a position where we were each other's best friends and allies inside the European Union, there's now quite a lot of tension, one gets the sense, between the two governments, which hasn't trickled down, I think, to the level of the peoples, uh, but, but you never know, because if, of course, Brexit ends up being catastrophic, if we end up having no deal because of the border, the Brexiteers will need somebody to blame, and we, along with the French, will probably be a fairly good um, uh, scapegoat. People talk about uh, using the issue of the border uh, in order to, to, to weaponize it, to, uh, you know, to, to turn it into something uh, which is potentially more inflammatory uh, than it is. I would say know your history, know your experience, know the people on the fringes of politics in Ireland uh, who are still trying uh, to be active and who would be uh, able to take advantage of a hard border and don't go there. Don't go there. How are you? All right. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Keep all the good work. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's that. Four years old. He's not good. Say Brexit. Brexit. Now the big danger for me in the UK now is if we don't leave the EU well, populism will get its fingernails back in. And that's a danger not just for the UK, that's a danger for Europe too. Because the last thing I can see, if, I hope you won't mind me saying, I can see in you as in me, if we end up with a Farage East, Steve Bannon Brexit, it'll be a disaster for the UK and potentially a disaster for Europe. In his fight to blow Europe out of the water, Nigel Farage has powerful allies. It's no accident that he was the first foreign politician Donald Trump welcomed after he was elected President of the United States. Trump believes in a nation state. Trump believes that migration is an issue that has to be carefully controlled, but is not against immigration. Trump believes in the concept that the nation state is the essential building block under which people want to live. On all of that, I find myself very much on the same level as Donald Trump. Nigel Farage is no longer hiding his ambitions. In 2017, he allied with a certain Steve Bannon, Donald Trump's former campaign director, a businessman, media mogul, and convinced nationalist who now dreams of uniting Europe's nationalist movements. He has founded the movement with a stated objective, seize power to destroy the European Union. Yeah, if you think about it, the globalists have Davos, the globalists have the Bilderberg Group. I mean, these are well-established structures, you know, and these people want to build world government. I mean, that's what it's all about. Uh, so Steve is trying to provide a counter. The beating heart of the globalist project is in Brussels. I drive the stake through the vampire. 
the whole thing will start to dissipate. We'll call it the movement or the cause or something like that. Everything converges on May of 2019, and that's literally when we take over the EU. It's going to overwhelm the new cycle. Warsaw, Athens, Berlin, Budapest, Stockholm, Rome, Oslo, Paris. Nationalist movements are gaining ground all over Europe. The way that Steve Bannon and others are trying to organize to, to break up the European Union, do not underestimate this. It's a very well worked out ideological play in Europe. And if we don't deal with the, the, the ground, the terrain that they are able to cultivate, if we don't deal with it in the right way, we are going to face a big problem in time to come. It is a, a, an unseen, unrevealed uh, threat uh, and danger uh, uh, to us all uh, in, in Europe. It seeks to undermine our unity, to destroy trust in our institutions, uh, it seeks to drive people to the extremes of politics and away from the uh, political uh, centre. Uh, it stands uh, for political values and objectives which are completely alien uh, to what traditionally we have believed in uh, and has given us our, our European character and outlook uh, on our continent. In the meantime, now, more than ever, it is crucial that we learn from Brexit before the tragedies of history repeat themselves throughout Europe. When I get home, I want to know you're standing with me.